This video is going to cover an introduction to anatomy and physiology. This is lecture one. The learning objectives that we're going to cover are shown here. We're going to introduce anatomy and physiology. Uh, we'll focus a lot on homeostasis and about pathways that regulate homeostasis in the body. So our first learning objective is to compare the study of anatomy to physiology. So since we're in a anatomy and physiology class, uh, this is important. I wanted to remind you that uh, each lecture is organized by learning objectives and also the workbook, the lecture notes, and the video are organized by learning objectives. Okay, so what's the difference between anatomy and physiology since you're taking this course? Well, anatomy is pretty easy. Anatomy is the study of the structures and parts of the human body. So whenever you think of anatomy, just think about the parts. Uh, we're doing human anatomy, but you could study anatomy of anything. Gross anatomy is really just the big stuff. What about physiology? Physiology is the study of the function of the human body. So sometimes people will talk about the processes that support life, and that's what physiology is all about. So in this course, we're going to study them together, anatomy and physiology. If we looked at this hockey accident where this hockey player was kicked uh, with a skate in the neck uh, by his teammate, he bled out a lot. The good news is that he survived. Uh, you might think, how would an anatomist think about this hockey accident? Well, the anatomist would be um, interested in the structures that were uh, severed or injured by that that skate and so in this case it was the right common carotid artery which is a huge artery that helps supply the, the brain with blood flow. You might also be concerned about well what muscles are in the neck. One of the big muscles in the neck is the sternocleidomastoid muscle. So was that injured or severed by the skate? To con contrast that a physiologist might be interested in, in what stress hormones were released in the minutes after that hockey accident. Uh, due to his low blood pressure, so maybe epinephrine and cortisol. A physiologist might also want to know how did the blood pressure change during all that blood loss? Did it go down? Uh, and if it went down, how much? And how did the body respond so that blood pressure didn't get too low so this person died? Uh, they actually survived, so their heart rate probably went up, and so the physiologist is thinking about function. The next learning objective, I just wanted you to think about defining some common terms that we'll hear throughout the course. And this is just some practice using Google and the video and notes uh, to find and answer uh, some questions. So learning objective two, try to define some of these terms here. One of them I'll help you with. Uh, this here are, these are the small intestines of a pig, uh, I think, if I believe Google image. And if we zoom in, way, way in, using a microscope and look at the small intestine, we can actually see the cells that line the inside to help digest your food. Uh, so in this case, we would use a microscope, and people that study histology study tissues, often using a microscope. So when you hear histology, think of microscopes and study of tissue. So I'll let you look up the rest of these, and we can check your answers uh, when you come to class, write your answers in your workbook. The next learning objective is to look at the levels of organization in the body and describe the relationship between each. So really I just wanted you to think about what you're made of and so obviously we can get pretty small, some pretty small stuff and so I wanted to look at the levels of that organization. So what are you made of? Well, One thing I hope you can remember is that you're made of cells. And so you might also think, well, I'm also made of organs, and what's the relationship there? Well, we also have molecules inside and outside our cells, like water. And then molecules are made of things like carbon and oxygen and nitrogen, so we might call those atoms. So what's the relationship between all these things? Uh, it's probably not as hard as you think. So let's start with looking at some cells. So if you have a cardiac muscle cell, a cell is the smallest living unit in the body. If we organize groups of cells together, we call those tissues. And if we take groups of tissues and layer those together, we might call that uh, an organ. So for example, if we started with a cardiac muscle cell, we're probably trying to build a heart. And so in this case, the organ there is the heart. 
So uh, basically, and this, uh, I'm not sure if that's really a human heart. It might be. It kind of looks like a sheep heart too. So remember, organs are basically made of tissues. Tissues are groups of cells. Well, what are cells made of? Well, cells are made of things like proteins and carbohydrates, fats, water, and lots of other stuff we'll learn about. And so you can build a cell with those things. If you look at a skin cell, you might pull out a very specific protein called keratin. You've probably heard of that in your hair and nails. Well, it's also in your skin cells. Well, proteins are made of amino acids. Well, what, what are amino acids made of? Well, they're made of um, uh, atoms called carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, hydrogen, things you've heard of. So if we take atoms, we can make molecules. If we take molecules, we can build cells. If we take cells, we can build tissues. And then if we take tissues, we can build organs. And then you'll see throughout the semester, we're going to actually organize the organs that uh, kind of function together. So for example, the heart, arteries, and veins help comprise an organ system, which we call the cardiovascular system. So we're going to talk a lot about organ systems as we go through the course, and often one or two lectures will cover an organ system. All right, so again, here is the cardiovascular system, which is your heart and blood vessels and blood. If you take the organ systems, you can build an organism. And so in this case, we're building you, a human. OK, next, list and describe the major requirements to keep a cell uh, from your body alive. So we can actually take cells out of your body and keep them alive. So it's important to remember that cells are the smallest living unit in your body and they're pretty um, high maintenance. We have to do a lot of things to keep little, your little cells alive. Your body has to. So things like oxygen and glucose and temperature are all important to keep those cells alive, uh, both inside your body and if we took them out and grew them uh, as scientists. All right, so what does a cell actually need to stay alive? Now, you may not think about that a lot, but your body does, and all the organ systems work together to keep your cells, uh, giving them what they need to stay alive. So you should try to make a list of things that your cells need. So I'll help you here and start it. They need things like glucose for energy. They need oxygen to help make uh, energy. They also need a fairly constant temperature, about 37 degrees Celsius. So think about more things your cells need, and we'll check these in class. It might surprise you that you can actually take human organs, digest out some of the living cells, and keep them in an incubator if you keep them happy, if you keep the cells uh, with all the things that your body gives them to keep them alive. So this kind of helps us with our next learning objective, explain the importance of homeostasis to survival. So let's define homeostasis. And at first I was going to Google it, and I did, and I didn't like the answer. So then I asked Siri, and Siri looked it up on Wikipedia, and I like the following definition for homeostasis. So homeostasis, a system in which variables are regulated so that the internal conditions remain stable or relatively constant. So basically, we're thinking about the process of homeostasis is the way your body keeps the inside of your body relatively stable, and that then keeps your cells alive. So again, keeping oxygen levels in your body constant, blood pressure constant, temperature relatively constant, they fluctuate a little bit, but we're doing, your body's doing all these things, your body's maintaining homeostasis to keep your cells alive. For our next learning objective, we're going to actually look at two examples of homeostasis in your body. One of them is arterial blood pressure. So our arterial blood pressure is that thing your doctor might tell you, 120 over 80. Well, that stays pretty constant throughout the day. And the other one is body temperature. So we regulate our body temperature to be fairly constant at about 98 degrees Fahrenheit or 37 degrees Celsius. So these two uh, variables stay very constant throughout the day to keep you alive and so they're great examples of homeostasis. Alright, so let's look at blood pressure first. So arterial blood pressure, the pressure in your arteries normally is about 120 over 80 or 110 over 60. If you were to lose a lot of blood because a bear or a shark bites you, uh, your blood pressure goes down. Hopefully that makes sense. If you lose a lot of your blood, the pressure in those arteries carrying the blood will be lower. 
The problem there is if it gets too low, you won't be circulating essential things around your body like oxygen and glucose, and of course you could die if it gets too low. So you don't want to die, you want to survive, so your body can make adjustments to maintain homeostasis. So the body's going to respond to maintain homeostasis, keep blood pressure as stable as possible so that you stay alive. How's the body going to do that? Well, it actually might be kind of intuitive to you. So let's think about it real quick. If your blood pressure is too low, one of the bad things that's going to happen is you're not going to get blood flow up to your brain or blood flow to your heart muscle and that will cause you to die. So the body's response is going to be to increase heart rate and pump more blood more vigorously which will help increase your blood pressure. You'll also decrease blood flow to non-essential organs like your intestines and your muscles or your skin uh, because you don't need that blood flow and that all is going to help increase the blood, flow or blood pressure and the blood flow to essential organs like your brain and your heart. So maybe you'll make it if you can get your blood pressure up into that homeostatic stable range. Another example of homeostasis is body temperature. And I put core temperature in there because that's what your body really cares about. The core being right around your organs and your heart and your brain. So we want to keep those stable, but you might be outside in the cold, maybe go to Flagstaff and go out in the snow. And all of a sudden your body temperature starts getting lower and lower because of the cold environment. If it gets too low, your body's going to need, again, to respond to maintain the stability in homeostasis. You could easily just go inside, but if you didn't have that ability, you would probably not sweat at all. You would also probably reduce your skin blood flow to keep your warm blood in your core. So you don't want to send the warm blood out to your extremities. It cools off and makes you even colder. So these are some of the ways that you can help maintain your core temperature even though it's cold. And if it's really, really cold, you actually might experience something called shivering where you actually get um, muscle contractions, not to lift your textbook or to run around, but you start getting these involuntary muscle contractions that help generate heat uh, through chemical reactions. So shivering is an extreme method uh, that your body uses to generate body heat. You may just move around voluntarily, which helps generate body heat as well. And hopefully that brings you back up into the homeostatic range and keeps your body temperature kind of stable. Uh, probably more um, of a better example in Mesa, Arizona is when your body temperature gets too hot. So say you're stuck outside a class for a while and all of a sudden all that uh, heat from the sun and the air temperature starts increasing uh, the temperature in your body. Quickly you'll start to sweat, so increase sweat rate, that helps cool you off. You'll also send that warm blood from your core to the skin, and so you'll increase skin blood flow. That helps, again, get rid of that warm blood, send it out to your skin, and your skin is hopefully cooling off from sweating and from evaporation, and so that uh, blood flow that goes out to your skin cools off and then returns to the core and helps cool you off. That doesn't always work in Arizona because it can get so hot, but that's what your body tries to do. All right, and then hopefully brings your body temperature back down to a more comfortable range. All right, so homeostasis, it's all about keeping the internal conditions and the internal environment of your body relatively stable. It doesn't stay perfectly steady, but pretty darn stable. So the examples that we looked at were arterial blood pressure, and body core temperature. Those need to stay fairly stable throughout the day, otherwise you could die. Again, they change a little bit. When you sleep at night, you get a little colder, and when you exercise, your blood pressure goes up a little bit. Okay, the next learning objective is to look at some of these pathways, and really, it's just to look at the vocabulary that scientists use when they talk about homeostasis and regulation of homeostasis. All right, so it's going to be some vocabulary so we can all talk about regulation of temperature, for example. Okay, so let's look at temperature again. If we think of where is the actual temperature regulation taking place in terms of where in our body uh, is it decided whether we're at a good temperature or a bad temperature. Well, in most cases, the brain is going to be in charge of homeostasis. So the brain is going to be the controller. 
it decides is my blood pressure good bad too low too high in this case is my temperature too high or too low so that's often the case not always but the brain will often be the controller so there's a place in your brain called the hypothalamus and it decides all day long whether your temperature is too high too low or just right so let's say your temperature is too high uh, your core temperature is too high because you're outside here in Mesa. Maybe you're even exercising. You might wonder, how does the brain know what your temperature is? Well, we're going to get some feedback from temperature receptors, basically cells or neurons that might be located in your head, your brain, your neck, your face, maybe even your skin, and they're going to send information back to your brain and those regions that are in charge of deciding whether your temperature is correct or not. So in this case, the, the information sent back to your brain is going to tell your brain that your temperature is too high. We call the information signals sent back to our brain afferent signals. Again, that's just vocabulary. Afferent signals are sent back to the brain. So the brain decides, okay, temperature is too high. What should the brain do now? The brain's going to want to bring our body temperature back down. So the brain is going to actually send out signals that cause you to increase sweating and to increase blood flow. The brain sends these signals out to things called effectors. In this case, the effectors would be your sweat glands and your blood vessels. Okay, so effectors are really just organs or tissues controlled by the brain. And so effectors then can change your, and bring your temperature back down. The brain's got to send out signals, and we call those signals efferent signals to remind us that they go to the effectors. All right, so again, hopefully the vocabulary is not throwing you off too much, but the result is that we have a better and more stable temperature now uh, that we've had this response. All right, just as a review, controller was the brain in this case. The receptors are simply cells or neurons that detect changes in homeostasis and then send those signals back to the controller and then the effectors were controlled by the brain and they simply are going to be able to make adjustments in things uh, needed for homeostasis all right afferent efferent signals just mean to or from the brain all right again our goal here is to maintain homeostasis so if the stimulus is a change in our temperature the response is going to be to bring that temperature back down to normal there's an interesting vocabulary word called negative feedback negative feedback regulation in homeostasis simply means that the body's always trying to resist change if something goes up and it shouldn't then it bring, the body brings it back down. In the case of blood pressure, if it's too low, your body adjusts it and brings it back up. Again, we call that negative feedback regulation because the body's always trying to resist change. All right, so negative feedback simply refers to our body's regulation of homeostasis, keeping change minimal, resisting change. So that's how I remember negative feedback keeps our blood pressure, our body temperature, oxygen levels in some homeostatic uh, range and maintaining stability. All right? And we can check and make sure this is making sense to you in class as well. The final learning objective is to name and describe the functions of the major organ systems. I'm going to let you do this one on your own. You can pull up Wikipedia or your textbook. Uh, here's an example. The urinary system involves the kidneys and bladder and some other organs they make urine or pee and most of that is to remove waste and, and different things that we don't need in our body anymore and to get them out alright so just spend a couple minutes on that don't spend a lot of time okay that is it I will see you guys in class see you